A uh, great honor to welcome Dr. Kush Washington uh, to give us a talk here in the department. Uh, he's uh, a, a distinguished research scientist and manager at IBM. Uh, and his main research focus is in fairness, machine learning, trustworthy machine learning. And he had a recent book published in this topic. So without further ado, I will hand the stage to Dr. Kush Washney. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, so let me share my screen and we can get going. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, the book that uh, was just talked about, so it's uh, titled Trustworthy Machine Learning, just like the, the talk today. Um, uh, so there's a free PDF available at uh, trustworthymachinelearning.com if anyone wants to download that or um, uh, there's a paperback edition it's uh, less than seven dollars so um, it's a pretty reasonable um, sort of thing right um all right so uh, as we go into the topic um, uh, we can kind of understand that um, ai is powering lots of critical workflows these days and uh, trust is essential um, so those could be uh, things like loan processing or employment customer management quality control etc um, Oh, and by the way, feel free to unmute yourselves, ask questions. Um, so uh, this is all for, for you guys. Um, and also in uh, scientific discovery, the same is true. Um, so across the board, whether it's in developing new materials or other things, um, uh, when using AI, trust is essential. Okay. Um, so many of you might have uh, seen these uh, headlines over the last several years um, where uh, decision making supported by machine learning had some sort of unwanted bias, whether it was in face recognition or healthcare, uh, personal finance, educational assessment, hiring, or uh, even criminal justice. Um, but it turns out that um, uh, these bias or fairness use cases are not just those headline grabbing ones, but um, there's many others that come up. Um, so if there's a telecommunications provider who's rolling out 5G or fiber optic cables, they're increasingly using machine learning approaches to um, figure out where to do this. And there's a lot of room for unfairness there. Um, if any of you have been to uh, Sam's Club recently, um, so that's the uh, warehouse store of uh, Walmart, um, uh, then when you're walking out the door, um, sometimes there's a person who's standing at the door and they scan your receipt and then um, the, sometimes the, their device will say, um, check the person's cart to make sure it matches what's in their, uh, on their receipt. And sometimes um, they'll uh, let you just go. Um, and uh, there's a machine learning uh, algorithm that's uh, behind that determination of whether the person should check your cart or, or not. And um, again, there's a lot of room for unfairness in this uh, case that some types of people might be unfairly targeted for um, uh, more checking than others. And uh, we actually um, have put in a, a bias mitigation algorithm into that. So um, uh, that's deployed uh, uh, already today. Okay. Um, one uh, example that I would have never thought of, um, uh, but I learned about when I was talking to someone from the uh, Indian Forest Service is that um, uh, they're starting to use machine learning to determine where to plant trees um, to uh, recover um, the forest and so forth. And um, there's a lot of indigenous uh, people um, who depend on the forest for, for their lives. And um, if this uh, machine learning algorithm that's uh, used for those decisions is done inappropriately, then uh, those people can suffer. So that's another fairness issue. Um, uh, in a lot of American cities, uh, if you uh, if you haven't paid for your water bill, for example, the um, uh, municipal water authority will um, uh, shut off your water. But that isn't just an automatic thing. Uh, there's a case by case determination of whether it should be done or not. And um, uh, there's uh, again some municip municipal water authorities are using uh, machine learning for making those determinations. And so, again, room for unfairness. Um, and one fun example, uh, so IBM uh, Watson uh, is used uh, to power some predictions for ESPN's uh, fantasy football site. Um, 
Uh, so it's uh, there's a prediction for individual football players, NFL uh, players per week, um, whether they'll boom or bust. So whether they'll exceed or um, uh, their expectations or go below. And um, uh, there's a machine learning algorithm behind that. And uh, the team uh, that developed that actually put in some of our uh, fairness technologies in there because um, a lot of the features in that prediction um, are at a team level. Um, and certain teams just get a lot of positive news coverage um, uh, compared to others. And so that biases um, uh, the individual player predictions. All right, but um, bias isn't the only thing when uh, we're talking about trustworthy AI. Um, so let's look at a couple of other examples. Um, so one example is from a fatality from Uber's uh, self-driving cars that happened a few years ago. And when they um, did the investigation and understood what this was about, like why this was happening, uh, then they realized that um, it had to do with how the false positives and false negatives um, were calibrated and, and so forth. Okay. Um, another example, uh, so many years ago, there was a hospital in Pittsburgh that trained a machine learning model to predict um, uh, which uh, patients who had entered with pneumonia would be readmitted to the hospital later. And it turned out that the model was saying that people who have asthma were less likely to be readmitted uh, later on. And this is counter to um, the medical understanding, but it happened to be true in that hospital because they had a special program for people who have asthma. Um, so if this model had been taken to any other hospital, it would have failed completely. Um, so now as we um, think about trust and trustworthiness, um, uh, we should define it properly, right? And it turns out that we can think about trustworthiness of AI very similarly to how we think about uh, trustworthy people. Okay? So think about it, um, if you're like hiring a carpenter to work on your house or something like that, what are the attributes you would need for that other person to be trustworthy? Uh, so in the organizational management literature, they've come up with four um, uh, attributes uh, that, that uh, kind of describe this. So the first attribute is competence. So is the other person able to do what they say that they're going to do? Uh, second is reliability, so that that competence sticks around in different conditions and different settings. Uh, third attribute is um, uh, some level of openness or uh, communication back and forth with the other person so they can understand you and you can understand them. And the fourth attribute is some level of selflessness so that they're um, working not just for their own goals, but something uh, more broadly, okay? And um, each of these attributes uh, can be directly mapped to what we want out of a machine learning system as well. Um, so the first attribute of competence uh, maps to accuracy. Um, and the second attribute of uh, reliability uh, maps to three different things. So there's distributional robustness, fairness, and adversarial robustness. And then on the third attribute, um, there's one direction, which is the machine communicating to us. Um, so that includes things like explainability, transparency, and uncertainty quantification. And then us communicating to the machine of what we want it to do, what its behaviors should be. Um, and uh, that is known as value alignment. Right? And then fourthly, um, uh, in terms of the selflessness, uh, if we are using AI uh, for social good and positive social impact, um, uh, that is one thing. Uh, also under this bucket, I would say, is uh, developing AI systems that uh, uh, actually empower all people, no matter what station in life that they're in, to use AI to meet their own goals. Okay. All right. Um, so just to quickly summarize, um, uh, what does it take to trust an AI system? We have to start with basic accuracy. Um, that's the starting point, but then there's all, the thing, all these things that go beyond that. So um, there's these considerations beyond accuracy, like fairness, explainability, uncertainty quantification, robustness, and uh, also privacy, um, having quality data, um, and ways of testing the system to ensure that um, it's meeting these goals. Okay. Um, so this occurs everywhere, um, no matter what domain or industry that you're looking at, um, there will be needs for fairness, explainability, uncertainty, quantification, robustness, et cetera. Okay. 
Uh, we did a small exercise going through a bunch of processes that are now being automated using AI in uh, banking. And we saw, I mean, yes, pretty much everywhere um, there is uh, uh, a role for, for all of these topics. Cool. Um, so before moving on, um, I wanted to just give a quick analogy um, just to uh, contextualize this topic of trustworthy machine learning. Um, so the picture that you see right now, um, it's uh, these are glass bottles from the late 1800s in which the Heinz company used to sell um, uh, their preserves and uh, sauces and, uh, and uh, pickles and so forth, right? Um, so why do I have that picture up, right? Um, so in the late 1800s, um, it was a really new concept that, oh, you can buy food that's already been made. Um, and uh, uh, there was not much trust um, in that uh, processed food. Uh, was there a question? No, okay. Um, so there wasn't a lot of trust in that, uh, I mean, in this industry, in the processed food industry. And the Heinz company um, did a lot to build that trust. and. Uh, the way they did it was um, through many different means. Um, so the first is that they uh, guaranteed that they would use unadulterated ingredients while other companies were using uh, wood pulp and other fillers in their ketchup. Um, uh, these glass, uh, clear glass containers was a big distinguishing point for them. So um, uh, they were selling their ketchup in uh, clear glass containers just like they do today um, uh, when others were selling their ketchup in uh, dark opaque uh, containers. Uh, they innovated a lot on sanitary food preparation. Um, they were the first company to offer free um, factory tours open to the public in Pittsburgh. Um, they lobbied for the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, uh, which later led to a lot of labeling requirements, tamper-resistant packaging requirements, and so forth. And they had a social mission um, uh, of uh, kind of freeing up people's time so they can do other things other than making uh, ketchup or other sauces. Okay. Um, but this was also a time where there was this tradition known as muckraking, uh, which is epitomized by the novel The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Um, so the idea of muckraking is that activists and journalists would um, go and uh, try to figure out what are all of the ills associated with um, uh, a particular industry and show them to, to the general public. Yeah. Um, so the same thing has happened with AI. Uh, so uh, it's a few years old now, but um, there's this really nice book um, by Kathy O'Neill entitled Weapons of Math Destruction. And she places her work in that same muckraking tradition, and she shows all of the ways that uh, data science and uh, so forth uh, uh, can lead society uh, astray. Okay. Um, so if we have that analogy on the muckraking, then what's the analogy in terms of what we do about it, right? So if we we're talking about unadulterated ingredients, it's similar to having quality data. If we have clear glass containers, it's like having interpretability and explainability of models. If we have free factory tours, it's like um, transparency of the overall development life cycle and something that I'll get to, which is called fact sheets. Um, if we have tamper-resistant packaging, it's uh, robustness to poisoning and adversarial attacks. Um, same sort of regulatory stuff with lobbying is happening. Um, AI for social good is the social mission. So there's a, a lot of analogies in um, uh, how to build trust for processed food and for, for AI. All right. Um, so that was kind of the introduction. Now let me get into um, uh, uh, what we uh, cared the most about, which is um, building the uh, the trust. Right. So. Uh, there's this really nice quote from uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr., one of the early CEOs of IBM that, uh, that I like. And he said that the toughest thing about the power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. Um, so those headlines I went over earlier um, uh, show you how easy it is to destroy the trust. Um, so now let's get into to the building. And if there's only two words that uh, you all take away from this presentation, I hope it's these two, uh, no shortcuts. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we go along. Um, uh, before we do, any questions or any uh, comments? Nope, okay, 
Um, so what do I mean by no shortcuts, right? Um, so uh, there's a very typical sort of AI life cycle, um, which uh, is uh, is this picture, right? So um, we have these multiple phases. So there's problem specification, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and then deployment and monitoring. Um, so there's different personas involved. Um, you see this set of diverse stakeholders on the side, which is not typically drawn on such a picture, but um, uh, let's go through these different stages one by one, and then I'll explain what I mean by not taking shortcuts. Okay. Uh, so first we have the problem specification phase. So this is where we're um, deciding what is the problem to solve? Should we even work on it? And then if so, um, uh, what are the key uh, sort of performance indicators that we'll judge the performance by? Okay. Um, so the shortcut is that problem owners and data scientists will assume that they know everything and just um, uh, specify a problem and then just run with it. Right? Um, but what they should be doing instead is um, pausing, bringing together a panel of uh, people with diverse experiences and take advice from them. Um, and the reason to do this is that um, uh, such a group um, actually is able to identify potential harms um, better than uh, than other groups. So, um, so that's the the reason for doing this. Um, all right. So then, the second fa two phases are, or the second and third phases are um, data understanding and data preparation. So the shortcut is just to assume that the data that's been given to you is great and just start modeling with it. Um, but what you should do instead is go back and see where did the um, uh, uh, where did this data come from? What sort of biases has it already picked up and, and so forth, right? Um, so there's this process of measurement. So that's deciding on the features themselves. Um, so that can introduce social bias. Um, so let me give you two examples of that. Um, so the first example is that uh, in the United States, um, uh, if you use the feature of, uh, of healthcare cost or healthcare utilization, as a feature for um, health predicting healthcare need, uh, there will be some bias because, um, uh, for example, African Americans tend to use the healthcare system less for the same amount of how sick they are. Um, uh, so that's one example. Another example is um, if you look at uh, the SAT or GRE, um, there's a reading comprehension section on the verbal part. Um, and um, uh, that reading comprehension becomes easier um, to answer the questions if you have some knowledge of what the passage is talking about, even if your ability to read is the same as anyone else. Um, so the, the score on the verbal section might be biased, uh, have social bias for that reason. Okay. Um, then there's sampling, so actually measuring the feature values for individual data points. Um, and here there can be population bias, um, so this can arise from uh, uh, undersampling or oversampling certain groups um, or just having poor quality data for certain groups. Um, there's temporal bias as well. So um, uh, uh, COVID gives us a great example of this. If you have data from before COVID, you train a model and then um, apply it in a post-COVID world, um, it might not do a great job. Okay. Um, then there's data preparation biases as well. Um, so uh, coming back to our healthcare example, so one of my colleagues, um, Maninder Singh, um, so he looked at, a, I mean, the same healthcare problem with different healthcare costs and seeing if they lead to racial bias against um, African Americans. And what he found is that um, if he left three different types of healthcare costs separate, um, so inpatient, outpatient, and emergency room, then there wasn't that much bias. Um, but if he just added all of them up into a single cost column, um, then there was a lot of bias. And this is not something where a, a data scientist would be doing this um, intentionally. It's just a normal practice because um, uh, these healthcare cost um, variables tend to have lots of zeros in them. And um, modeling with uh, columns with all of zeros is, um, is a bit challenging. So if you just add up a bunch of things, you'll end up with something that has fewer zeros and then um, it might be uh, easier to develop models for. So um, just that process by itself without any malicious intent can um, uh, exacerbate or lead to biases. Um, this is also a point where uh, data poisoning attacks can, can happen. Okay. 
All right, so then uh, we move to the next stage, which is modeling. Um, so most machine learning models are just uh, optimization algorithms. Um, so an optimization algorithm, what is it going to do? It's just going to find the minimum or maximum in the best possible way um, without worrying about anything else. And so the algorithms themselves take shortcuts. Okay. Uh, so on the image on the left, we have a, uh, a hillside um, and the model predicts that there's uh, grazing sheep there. Um, so it's using the background when uh, to describe the image, even though there are no sheep. Uh, so it's taking that shortcut. Um, in the second image, uh, the, uh, uh, the model is going to say that there's a teapot in the image, even though there is not, it's just some weird patterns um, uh, because it's using these features that, uh, that make no sense. Okay. Uh, in a medical imaging scenario, um, if the uh, model focuses on uh, writing in the image or tokens and these sort of things rather than the patient's anatomy, um, then it's not really diagnosing uh, disease properly. Or if the model is getting fooled by some extra text, uh, it's uh, placed at the end. Okay. Um, so if the models themselves are taking shortcuts, uh, then what we need to do is to get the models to slow down and um, uh, put in some mitigations, okay? Um, so there's uh, a few places where we can intervene. Uh, there's pre-processing, there's uh, during the model training, and then there's post-processing. And across all of these different areas of our pillars of trustworthiness, we have interventions. And I'll come back to this later, um, but I'll close the loop with the, um, uh, the life cycle, and then we'll um, dive a little bit deeper into these, okay? Um, so yeah, just closing the loop. So on the evaluation side, um, uh, again, if we are not taking um, uh, input from a panel of diverse voices, then uh, we're missing out because uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, potential um, harms that can be noticed by, uh, by that group. And then on the monitoring, um, uh, the first shortcut that people take is uh, not monitoring at all. So they'll put a machine learning model out in production and just leave it. Um, um, but so you should be monitoring it. Um, and then secondly, monitoring it not just for accuracy, but for these other topics like fairness and robustness and explainability. Okay. All right, so summary um, again. So don't take shortcuts anywhere in the AI lifecycle. Right. Um, so now let's come back to modeling um, and go through um, these different topics. Okay. All right. So an explanation is a justification for machine learning prediction. And one thing we like to focus on at IBM Research with our explainability is that um, the explanations should be focused on and satisfy the needs of uh, different consumers of the explanations. So um, depending on their persona, their goals, their needs, and so forth. So there's different types of explanations. You can explain data versus models. You can explain individual predictions. So that's a local explanation or the entire model. So that's a global explanation um, and do it in terms of either uh, samples or features or other things. And then um, also either have an approximation or not. And um, uh, all of these are um, uh, kind of different ways of explaining, and those are things that we've been uh, working on. And uh, we actually have an open source toolkit uh, that implements all of this. So it's known as AI Explainability 360. Okay. Uh, then there's unwanted bias. Um, so this is something that's placing privileged groups at systematic advantage and unprivileged groups at systematic disadvantage. Okay. Um, so we've already talked through where does a lot of this unwanted bias come from. So it could be in misspecifying the problem, uh, feature engineering, data preparation sort of stuff, uh, prejudice in the historical data or sampling issues. Um, so then what we want to do is mitigate those biases. And um, the reason that it's not easy is because there's other variables um, in a data set that can recreate the information in so-called protected attributes. So things like race and gender and, and things of that nature. So if you just drop those variables, um, you, these other variables are gonna still contain a lot of that information. So you actually have not mitigated the bias. You just made it harder on yourself to find out if you if, uh, if you did or didn't. Okay. Um, so what you really need to do is um, uh, aim for some sort of statistical independence between two random variables. Um, 
So the first is this protected attribute, like race or gender, and the other um, random variable is um, uh, the predicted label, um, so the, uh, the decision. And um, if you can achieve some kind of independence between the two, then you've uh, achieved some uh, sort of fairness. And the link uh, and the um, screenshot on the right is a report we put out um, last year, um, or I guess maybe it's been two years now. Um, and uh, it's an example of how we used uh, one of our toolkits, um, AI Fairness 360, to mitigate bias in um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination messaging. Um, so we wanted to make sure that um, uh, everyone uh, was getting this uh, vaccination uh, uh, ads, I mean, equally. So, uh, and the algorithm that was being used uh, at the time was uh, targeting middle-aged women more than anyone else. So uh, we showed how to make sure that everyone got, uh, got the message that they should get vaccinated. Good. All right. Um, so then there's uh, the adversarial robustness. Uh, so an adversary is a malicious actor trying to meet their own goals, often at the detriment of uh, the system designers. Uh, so there's a lot of things that bad guys can do. Um, they can either get to know and steal information that they're not supposed to have. Um, so an extraction attack is um, getting knowledge about the model parameters. An inference attack is getting information about the training data that the um, attacker is not supposed to have. And then they can also make the system perform differently, um, either worse or um, through some backdoor attacks and so forth in specific ways. Um, so there's data poisoning attacks on the data and evasion attacks where um, uh, some cleverly, uh, uh, I think some clever perturbation to the input can uh, make the, the model do something different. Okay. Um, so adversarial robustness is all about detecting, preventing and certifying against those attacks um, by malicious adversaries. Um, but there doesn't have to be a bad guy involved. So um, uh, adversarial robustness is just as useful um, as a test um, for ourselves as we're uh, building these systems. Uh, so you already heard my uh, analogy about uh, processed food. So um, here's another one. Um, so let's look at uh, commercial aviation, right? Uh, so we can say that uh, aviation started around 1903 when the Wright brothers had their first flight. And the first 50 or so years were to about 1958. Um, and this is when the first commercial jet, the Boeing 707 was introduced, okay? And that first 50-ish years um, was all about just understanding how to make airplanes fly, right? Um, and since then, uh, so the second 50 years have been very different. Um, so the commercial jet is not fundamentally different, right? So it flies basically at the same speed with the same basic functionality. Um, so today's planes are just, uh, I mean, variations on the Boeing 707. Um, but what has improved um, a lot over um, the, the next 50 or so years has been um, uh, I guess um, even more than that, has been uh, vastly improved safety, efficiency, and automation. So one statistic that um, is around is that um, the uh, the fatality rate per miles flown in commercial, uh, I mean, not commercial, I mean, among all air, uh, aircraft is uh, around 400 times less than it was in the 1970s. Um, so a huge improvement uh, when the number of miles has also gone up uh, a huge amount. So what's the analogy, right? Um, so we can mark um, the first 50 years of AI to be maybe starting around 1956 when there was this famous Dartmouth conference, um, uh, which defined AI itself. Um, so the picture on the right, you see um, Claude Shannon, Marvin Minsky and folks, um, but interestingly, the guy in the bow tie on the left, um, uh, he's an IBM researcher um, named Nathaniel Rochester, who was part of this as well. So he. Uh, drove up uh, from where I'm sitting right now in our uh, Yorktown Heights, New York lab. Right? Um, so we can say that um, the first 50 years were up to about, let's say, 2012, um, which is when uh, deep neural networks were used to win the ImageNet competition. Okay. Um, so again, uh, first 50 years, just about understanding how to make AI work. Um, and now um, we're in these uh, second 50 years. Okay. Um, so what do we need to focus on? We need to focus on making AI more safe, reliable, fair, trustworthy, efficient, and automated. And that's what, what we are doing. 
Um, so I used this word safe. And uh, in fact, those four attributes that I talked about before, um, the first two, um, I would say, are very much about safety, right? Um, so if we look at the engineering literature, um, so safety engineering in general, uh, they've come up with uh, four main strategies for um, achieving safety in engineered systems. Uh, the first is called inherently safe design. So this is the idea of excluding potential hazards from a system. And an example is filling a dirigible airship with helium instead of hydrogen, because then there's no chance that it will ignite. Okay. Then there's safety margins. So this is where a system is stronger than it needs to be for an intended load. Um, and uh, an example is hurricane resistant windows, or I guess uh, since I'm talking to Iowa State, maybe it should be cyclone resistant windows. Um, uh, so being thicker than um, uh, any, uh, the, the maximum sort of uh, uh, wind speed that you would ever encounter. Um, then there's safe fail. Um, so systems remaining safe even when they fail in their intended operation. Uh, so an example is what's called a dead man switch on a train. So if the train engineer lets go, the train stops in its tracks. Um, and uh, what will happen is, uh, I mean, the train isn't doing its intended operation, which is going forward to its destination, but it will have stopped hopefully in a, in a safe situation. Okay. And then there's procedural safeguards. Um, so these are measures beyond ones that are uh, designed into the core functionality of the system. Uh, so these would be things like certifications, warning notices, and other human factors sort of things. Okay. Um, so now, what does that mean in the case of AI? Right? Uh, so when we're talking about inherently safe design, uh, things like causal modeling become important. Um, when we're talking about safety margins and safe fail, things like uncertainty quantification and selective classification are important. And when we're talking about procedural safeguards, uh, things like transparency can come up as well. Okay. Uh, so let's go through those one by one. Uh, so causality is the idea that uh, there should be an, a cause and effect relationship between the input and the output. And uh, normal machine learning doesn't do this. Um, it's just finding uh, associations or correlations. Um, so what we need to do is focus on um, building models that, uh, that have a causal nature. Okay? Um, so here's just an example to help you start thinking that way. Let's say, um, there's two random variables. Uh, there's the average temperature of a city and there's the elevation above sea level of that same city, okay? Um, all of us kind of intuitively know that um, being at high altitude causes a city to be cold. Um, but uh, if you were to present uh, rather than the other way around, right? um, it's not that being cold causes the city to be at high elevation. Um, so, but if we were to present data to a, um, a machine learning model, uh, a machine learning algorithm, um, it would just as easily go one way or the other. Um, right? So um, what does that imply? Um, so if we are talking about fairness, then um, uh, if gender does not cause creditworthiness, then we don't want a model to pick up on that. Um, uh, so a causal model would not, whereas a regular machine learning model would. Um, similarly, if um, having a green pasture doesn't cause there to be grazing sheep there, um, uh, then again, uh, we want uh, a causal model so that um, that sort of uh, lack of robustness doesn't show up. Um, then there's uncertainty quantification. So does the model know when it doesn't know? Um, so is it intellectually humble? Can it present its own limitations? Uh, so there's two main types of uncertainty. Um, there's aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. Uh, so aleatoric uncertainty is the idea that um, there's some inherent randomness in the underlying phenomenon that we're measuring. And epistemic uncertainty is where there's some gap in our knowledge. So maybe some part of the feature space in which we have not taken any measurements. And because of that, there's um, uh, a lot of uncertainty. So both of those combine uh, to give us total uncertainty. Okay. Uh, so let's look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, so this is a problem of crowd counting. So try and estimate how many people are in a given picture. Uh, so it is good to do that uncertainty estimation because then uh, we can set a safety margin. For example, um, uh, how many people um, 
uh, can fit into a, a venue or are we over capacity, um, these sort of things. Okay? And there's algorithms that can help you separate out uh, epistemic from aleatoric uncertainty as well. Um, then uh, there's the uh, say fail. Uh, so this is an example from dermatology. Uh, so there's two different examples here um, of three images each. Um, so if you look at the bars at the bottom, the task is to um, make a prediction on which disease is shown in the image. Uh, there's eight uh, possible diseases and, um, sorry, seven possible diseases. And um, uh, the height of the bar indicates how confident the um, uh, system is. And so if there's one bar that stands out and all of the other are close to zero, that means the um, uh, system is very confident. And if all the bars are about the same height, then it's not very confident. Okay? Um, so in both examples, in all three situations, the um, uh, system is correct, right? Um, it always, the red bar is the, uh, the highest uh, bar, but um, uh, if the system is not very confident, then we shouldn't have it uh, uh, provide a, a decision uh, in an autonomous way. It should revert back to an uh, expert human dermatologist so um, so that it is doing the right thing. And for this to happen, the quantification of the uncertainty needs to be correct and calibrated. All right. Um, so last one um, on this is transparency. So um, this is all about uh, capturing and reporting uh, so-called facts throughout uh, development lifecycle. Um, so before I had the life cycle drawn as a circle here, it's just um, uh, uh, vertically. Um, so we have these different stages and uh, what a fact sheet or um, a collection of facts is, is um, a bunch of uh, quantitative and qualitative information. So things like um, uh, what were the intended uses? What test results do we have um, across different things? Um, what choices were made in the processing, all of that can, should be captured and uh, as automatedly as possible, and then rendered out as different fact sheets um, for different consumers with, with different needs. And that helps with the, with the transparency. Cool. Um, you can build these very fancy governance processes uh, on top of these fact sheets as well. And that's um, all of these procedural safeguards. Cool. Um, so I mentioned our open source toolkits a couple of times. Um, so uh, definitely check them out. Um, uh, these are the websites for all of them. So for fairness, explainability, robustness, uncertainty, quantification, privacy, um, uh, causal inference and fact sheets. So there's a bunch of uh, glossaries, tutorials, um, reference materials, some interactive web demos and stuff as well. And then there's links to the um, uh, GitHubs as well from, from there. Okay. Um, so this talk would not be complete if I didn't talk about foundation models. Um, so let me do that. Um, so a foundation model is a model trained on broad data at scale such that it can be adapted to a wide range of downstream tasks. Um, these days they're often based on what's called the transformer architecture and uh, often trained using self-supervised learning. So this is the idea that don't need to have label data, but you kind of mask out parts of the data so that um, the model, uh, the algorithm is guessing what was masked out and by that it's learning the patterns. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with uh, uh, large language models, um, but uh, it's not just that. So uh, I'm sure uh, all of you have uh, played around with ChatGPT uh, and GPT-4 and everything like that. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not just NLP. So um, something we're doing at IBM is uh, uh, building these foundation models for other modalities, um, for uh, time series and tabular data, for molecules, for, for other things as well, sensor data and, and so forth. Okay. Um, so if we want these um, foundation models to um, do what we want them to do, um, there's a few different approaches. Uh, so remember these numbers one through five. Um, so the first is um, just the, uh, this pre-trained model by itself um, trained on a vast data set. Then we can um, uh, train on a more specific professional data set instead. Um, there's fine tuning, um, there's prompt tuning or model reprogramming, which do something on the input side. And then there's post-processing on the output, okay? Um, so coming back to bias and things like that. Um, so we've noticed that um, if you uh, have the original big model uh, trained on vast data, there will be toxicity and there will be unfairness. And uh, 
uh, there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. Even if you filter out a lot of data, it still um, uh, will have uh, a lot of toxicity and, and uh, unfairness. Okay? Even on very professional data sets, this is true. Um, so we looked at a, um, a data set of, um, uh, of clinical notes. Um, so this is from hospitals and, and doctors and stuff. And even then there's some amount of racial bias um, in that where you wouldn't maybe think that there would be. So uh, black patients are described as very demanding um, compared to, to white patients. Okay. Um, so what can you do instead, right? Um, so there's a few different things that we can do instead. Uh, so one thing um, is what we uh, have called fine, uh, what we've called equituning. So this is part of uh, fine tuning. Uh, so mathematically, we can impose uh, what's called a group equivariant structure to make sure that uh, different groups are treated uh, the same in the, in the generative process. Um, there's fairness reprogramming. So this is an approach um, uh, for being able to um, uh, kind of add something to the uh, to the prompt that forces the model to act more fairly. And then on the post-processing side, uh, there's a variety of things that we can do as well. Um, uh, one of them uh, was at NIRIPS last year um, called uh, the FAIR Infinitesimal Jackknife, which um, is able to figure out um, which data points uh, in the training set were the ones that were causing the unfairness and then zero out their influence without um, actually having to retrain. So I think that's a pretty interesting idea. Yeah. And uh, this is not just about fairness. So when we're talking about explainability or uncertainty quantification as well, there are approaches for uh, that we can apply to, uh, to foundation models. Um, so just to summarize this, um, so uh, process flow for large language models or for um, foundation models is a bit different than um, uh, what we saw with the um, uh, uh, with the data science sort of workflow. So um, again, there's different things that we can do at, uh, at different stages. Um, so let me end there um, and uh, happy to take questions or any other uh, discussion that anyone wants to, uh, to bring forward. So thank you. Thank you for your talk. That's very, very interesting. Uh, maybe we will start a uh, question from the audience if you want to unmute to uh, or if you want to type your question, either way works. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Usman. Um, so uh, going back to one of your slides where you showed us the um, the output confidence in the dermatology uh, yeah. application. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when, when you when you showed us those red graphs, do do they correspond to the uh, the output probabilities or are they certain different scores? So like, I'm wondering whether um, the probability of an output that, that a model makes, does that translate or map to the certainty or uncertainty yeah. it has in its yeah. prediction? Yeah, so those were, I mean, yeah, seven disease classes and uh, ideally they would be probabilities. Um, that's what you would want them to be. Um, uh, often um, certain types of models are not calibrated, so they don't produce true probabilities, even if the numbers are between zero and one. Um, so uh, the process of calibration would try to make them into probabilities so that we can interpret them that way. Thank you. And I had a quick follow-up um, yep. on something related. So, um, mm -hmm. so when you mentioned those two different types of uncertainties, um, mm -hmm. is there any... Um, or has any relationship been found between uncertainty? I know calibration in itself mm -hmm. is a uh, metric for fairness by you know calibrating for all different groups. Mm -hmm. um, but is there any um, certain relationship between a certain model um, and how fair slash unfair it can be? Yeah, yeah that? that's a great question. Um, so if that uh, calibration or the certainty um, was the same across all groups, um, then uh, it, there would not be any relationship with fairness. But what usually happens is that um, uh, the models are also, in addition to being, I mean, less accurate across groups, they might also be um, uh, less, I mean, have more uncertainty on certain groups. And uh, this is a natural phenomenon, especially if um, uh, the protected groups happen to also be minorities, um, then they'll have less uh, data points associated with them, which implies more uncertainty for them. So. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, 
many times there will be uh, also uh, differences in the uncertainty, which is uh, also a form of unfairness. It doesn't have to be, um, and it's not always the case that the minority is the um, unprivileged group. So um, I, you can think about um, uh, like South Africa, for example, where um, there was a very small white minority that was the one in power. Um, so um, they weren't, even though they were the minority, they weren't the um, uh, so-called unprivileged group, but um, uh, but presumably they would have had more uncertainty in their data um, potentially. So, um, I mean, it depends on the specifics, but uh, yeah, oftentimes uh, it is the case that the um, minority group has less data, more uncertainty, and um, against whom the unfairness is usually more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, very nice talk, Akush, thanks. So mm -hmm. I have a question. You talk about uh, some of these machine learning models that take shortcuts. Yeah. So one of the reasons behind uh, taking the shortcuts is because uh, there are just not enough training examples or because there are uh, you know, the computational demand is high, they're trying to lower the, the demand. Um, no, I wouldn't even say it that. I mean, like, uh, if you're, it's an optimization problem that you've set up, um, then there's no reason for the system to bring in extra constraints when it shouldn't, when it's not, when they haven't been specified, right? Um, so uh, a lot of these uh, sort of things that we're talking about, um, we might in our minds think that that's what the system is supposed to do, but if we haven't specified it, that these are extra constraints that um, don't use the background in order to predict um, the foreground and stuff, then uh, why wouldn't the uh, the algorithm actually, uh, I mean, use all the information that it can um, to, uh, to do the best that it thinks um, based on the objective and, uh, uh, I mean, th that you've set for it. So um, that's where I would say is really the issue. So it's it's basically the uh, the constraints that are provided to the optimization algorithms, and mm -hmm. some of them are were initially not anticipated. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hi. So uh, my question is a bit related to the first question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, if you could comment on trade off between focusing on correctness versus working working on deviasing the system. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you mentioned that uh, uh, you test for independence between certain variables like gender, etc. Mm -hmm. I believe that by default, it will erase certain information and may introduce, you know, uh, new bias into the system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the long run, wouldn't it help if we solely focus on, say, correctness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me uh, bring up one of my slides and talk through that. Um, so... Uh, it's a great question. It comes up uh, with from a lot of uh, people who uh, uh, are very concerned about uh, kind of their bottom line. So when we talk to banks, for example, um, this comes up a lot, right? So, um, so look at this picture for for now, right? Um, so when you say correctness, I'm going to interpret that as the accuracy of the model, okay? Um, and uh, so, you... uh, yeah. can I? Uh, mm -hmm. So right now, uh, like for example, if you take adversarial robustness, mm -hmm. so uh, the research on that showed that mm -hmm. our state of the art CNN models, mm -hmm. they were using very brittle features, like they were mm -hmm. just overfitting on the texture, yep. and yep. they were not shape aware. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, like the research uh, mm -hmm. gave us certain methods uh, which made the uh, model look into the shape mm -hmm. specifically. So mm -hmm. I think that there is a difference between accuracy and correctness. Correctness will also tie to the interpretability of the model, like, you know. Uh, um, whether... so, so say more about that. So how would you measure correctness without measuring it as accuracy? Um... So, uh, that is closely tied to, I believe, the interpretability of the model. And I agree that it's a challenging problem and we should do something instead of, you know, just mm -hmm. saying that we do not have any method we are just training the model on a certain loss. No, but, so but, how would, uh, but how would the explanation help you with correctness? Um, so can you say more about that? So in, for example, and mm -hmm. again, I am not uh, like, I do not have all the answers. So sure. that's why I was asking for your opinion. Mm 
Yeah. So if I if you showed an image where there mm -hmm. was just some grass and mm -hmm. the model predicted that something is grazing in the grass. Mm -hmm. So that happened because the model uh, was not focusing on the features which it was supposed to feature, uh, supposed to focus. I mean, but supposed to is a human conception. I mean, we didn't tell the model that it shouldn't focus on things, that, but um, but go yes. ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So if we ask the model that, why did you make this prediction? And okay. there are certain algorithms, like we can mm -hmm. take the gradient and we can see that which part it is looking at, mm -hmm. then we will just see some random, you know, dots mm -hmm. in the images. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, like now, mm -hmm. if we use an adversarial robust uh, model, Mm -hmm. Then it will show us exactly that, hey, there is the animal and like this mm -hmm. is the silhouette of the animal. Mm -hmm. And then we could be more confident that it is correct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, like yeah so this... I think you've already answered your own question. I mean, that means that correctness to you is um, all these things, right? It's um, robustness, it's fairness, it's all of these things. Um, because uh, if you're saying that uh, you need the explanation to match your own intuition on um, uh, what it's supposed to be. It's not about just matching the ground truth labels with um, uh, the uh, the predicted labels. Then uh, that's exactly why all of these things come come about. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. like focusing on debiasing the model, in mm -hmm. my humble opinion, is actually not the correct way to deal with the problem. So because now let me yeah. So now let me tell you what I was going to tell you. Um, yeah, so sure. um, all right. So. Uh, so for argument's sake, let's assume that uh, someone is measuring correctness using accuracy, okay? Um, so just, I mean, have that as a starting assumption, okay? Uh, so how would they measure that accuracy? They would have to have a held out data set, um, which has the same distribution as the data set on which the model that they're uh, debiasing is, okay? Um, so now if you assume that um, uh, that that there are biases that you're trying to mitigate, then isn't it uh, a problem that you're using a model that, ha I mean, a data set that has the biases to compute the accuracy? Um, so think about that for a second, right? Um, so if there's an ideal data set in which there are no biases, um, so that's what we would say is in this construct space. Um, so assume that there is some world in which there are no biases, right? So you would want to measure accuracy in that world as well. So if we had uh, held out test data from the construct space, that is where we would be measuring accuracy, but we don't ever have that. So that's a problem of how we measure the accuracy. So uh, we actually have a paper, um, it, uh, was at ICML 2020, that um, shows provably that um, if you um, are working in this construct space, then bias mitigation actually leads to node um, degradation and in, uh, inaccuracy in the construct space itself. So the problem that we have is that uh, uh, the way we um, operationally can measure accuracy is on bias data if we believe that we are deep biasing. All right, thanks for your answer. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, thoughts, uh, questions, comments? I have one qu uh, question, but I don't know if uh, mm -hmm. IBM uh, can release anything about mm -hmm. that. I think we are uh, also in a uh, phase that uh, talking about government innovation in mm -hmm. ensuring mm -hmm. AI technologies to be mm -hmm. fair or you know trustworthy. So mm -hmm. uh, from you, you know, industry perspective, mm -hmm. what's the, going to be the impact of that kind of regulation? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we're already seeing it. I actually advised NIST on um, their uh, AI risk management framework that they came out with a few weeks, maybe a month and a half ago. Um, uh, and there's all sorts of regulations that are coming down. Um, so in New York City, um, uh, near where I live, um, in about, uh, what is it, like 18 or 19 days, there's going to be this uh, hiring law that's going to be in force. Um, so it's going to say that any New York City resident that applies for a job, um, and if AI is used um, in any evaluation process, it has to be fair and explainable. So um, uh, things are happening. Uh, I mean, in Colorado, there's a law already in force for uh, AI use in insurance. In European Union, um, there's this AI Act, which uh, should soon be uh, passed and enforced. In Canada, there's um, uh, 
some things that are happening in Singapore. I mean, everywhere you look, there are. Um, and to me, um, they're going to be a kind of a forcing function um, to um, get more um, of these things that I talked about uh, as part of deployed systems, um, because uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, anyone who's doing uh, developing the systems, they can, are putting themselves at risk for being fined and, and so forth. So that's what's going to happen. Um, but uh, it's not just regulation. I think that's uh, forcing this. Um, so there's actually this economist, uh, Lawrence Lessig, um, from the University of Chicago, and he talked about how there's kind of four different things that influence um, technology and how they um, uh, get regulated. And laws are one, but um, uh, another category is uh, social norms. Uh, so if society is asking for things, then technology has to follow. Um, a third is uh, market demands as well. So if companies aren't able to sell their stuff, um, then they have to respond to that as well. And then um, uh, lastly is um, uh, kind of the architectures of the technology itself. So if there's been things already built um, in the past, then they also influence what um, is, is done going forward. So all of that is, I mean, are going to are and are going to continue to be um, kind of forcing functions on, on AI going forward. Uh, I had one question, if you could please yeah. answer. Um, so you talked about uncertainty for big data. I was wondering if um, you have limited data set in cases of industrial application, uh, what methods would you recommend for measuring that uncertainty? Um, guessing cross-validation may not work given the less amount of data, or maybe it will. I don't know. I want to know your opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh... The quantification of the uncertainty um, is uh, something that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you can not exactly cross validation, but I mean, through bootstrapping and other similar approaches, you can um, get some good estimates of, uh, of the uncertainty. Um, there's, I mean, methods that inherently produce an uncertainty estimate, like uh, Bayesian neural networks and things of that sort. So, I mean, it really depends on uh, your situation and, uh, kind of uh, what you're looking to do. But um, uh, the open source toolkit that I mentioned, the, the UQ360, the Uncertainty Quantification 360, it implements um, a bunch of different methods, uh, so both intrinsic and extrinsic uh, that you can use. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we probably just have time for one final question here. Any, any question? Okay, uh, if no more questions, then let's stop here since uh, I think it's time for Kush dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.